Hi, this is Malus Peters. In this video, I'm going to come back to the concept of quality by design. And quality by design, as I described previously, is a method of having inbuilt quality control and is often used within the pharmaceutical industry. Now, here I'm going to give you two key examples and mainly I will show you what type of plots or what kind of strategies you can expect. In this video, I'm going to go for uh, two case studies and the two case studies, the links you can see in this slides are fairly different. The first one is a development of a generic uh, pharmaceutical drug where there's a mixing of two uh, APIs in there. Uh, because a lot of information in the pharmaceutical industry is actually confidential, it's quite hard to find information out there. And you can also find that in this uh, manuscript if you would go to, to the link. However, uh, it does give you like a general understanding of what kind of strategies and what kind of tools you would use to either minimize the risk or to showcase the design space and, and variables that are important. The second one is not about the development of a pharmaceutical per se, but it's about how you would coat like a tablet with a certain active ingredient, which via this solution, and in this case it changes to pH, can be used to treat gastritis. So here, because it's a coating, it's a slightly different process. Also, I'll come back to a general summary where I will discuss what you kind of could have learned from these uh, case studies and what kind of methods you can use uh, when you're working with BioRay Access yourself to apply this principle. Now, the first case study, it was about bringing a pharmaceutical to market. And in, in this case, they wanted to accelerate bringing it to market. And if I already jump forward to the kind of conclusion they reached, is they actually found that they use a 30% reduction time of uh, the development and the validation stage. So that's really very, very significant impact that these strategies had within this particular case. Now, they used uh, two uh, active pharmaceutical in ingredients, or so two APIs, which were mixed together and they were used in solid dosage for an oral form. So the use of two APIs is quite common. So bearing in mind that if you often have tablets, you don't necessarily just have the, the pharmaceutical ingredients as well. You could have stabilizers, you could have binders, you could have excipients. So normally you're dealing with a mixture of much more than just the active pharmaceutical ingredients. And you will actually see that when we come back to the design of experiments, the diagram that they've used, where they also show the impact of stabilizer and excipients. Um, also, when you work with these active pharmaceutical ingredients, it's often that they're not exactly within the same ratio. Uh, so you will see here that one is really the dominant form and the other one is um, a present in much less form, but they're still equally as important. But the ratio between the two does play a key role, as you will see later on. Generally, what you would start with is starting with the CQAs, which are the critical quality attributes. So you need to define what they are. And then you also need to rank them to how important they are. So in this case, it started off with around 20 uh, and then they reduced that and brought it down to around 15. But you can imagine that's still a lot of things that you have to, to measure and to control. What you will consider is first of all, the uncertainty that you have and also the impact uh, that a certain thing has on your final uh, output. So not all of, th of these, uh, if they change a little bit, would have a big uh, impact on the final product quality. And the uncertainty comes back to the fact that you're relying on the data that's available. So in a lot of the cases, when you develop a pharmaceutical, and this was also the case for this particular one here, it could be that the active pharmaceutical ingredient is already used to treat like another disease. So that's also a way of minimizing the risk within the pharmaceutical industry. And it does mean that there is quite a lot of literature available on certain effects. So for instance, you would know that this wouldn't cause any toxic effects, which is a big benefit when you look at developing it further down the line. So this uncertainty kind of decreases when you start to get more information. And this information can go come from literature sources, but it can also be around small scale experiments that you want to do using your design of experiment approach. By bringing it down to these uh, CQAs, it also helps with defining what experiments you want to do. So obviously experiments take time, they take resources, and it takes uh, a lot of time to analyze it as well. 
So what you want to do is define these first, uh, probably using literature strategies, so you can set up that approach of the design of experiments. And that means that you start to vary the parameters and that you can figure out using mathematical equations what the impact of uh, certain variables is on the product quality. Now, finally, what they did here, the final outcome was, and I said it really helped to, to reduce the development and validation time. It gave them a way of deciding what would constitute a good batch if certain parameters, so this is again where it comes back to your design space, were within certain specs, you could decide this is a good batch to use. And also they implemented some sensing strategies to minimize the failure. So also what they would do is figure out what do you need to monitor as the product process is going along in order to figure out when uh, things might start to go off. When you do your design of experiments, you systematically change parameters in order to figure out how it uh, influences product quality. And that's exactly what you can see here in this diagram. You can see how a certain uh, change in variable X would change the input on Y. So here it will nicely show you what the impact is. We've got like five different Y, so five different targets that we want to reach. And when you start to change things, in this case, they look at the stabilizer and the excipients, which I said are also key components of the tablets often, and the ratio between the two active pharmaceutical ingredients, how that impacted on these different factors. And in some cases, you would see that it wouldn't have an impact. So look, when you see those straight lines, for instance, you could see that it didn't matter kind of what concentration you used. But in certain cases, you would see decreases or increases in terms of the prediction of the assay, in terms of the impurities, etc. So you have to find some kind of middle ground here and have to decide what would be the best in order to make sure that you hit all the different targets. And this is just one way of how you can showcase this during these diagrams. But later on, I will also show you that if you want to, to showcase the design space, you can look contour plots or surface plots. So there are multiple ways of how you can show this. So within directly, it's a very easy way of representation. So you don't need to go through all the maths. You can see by eye what works and what doesn't work. Another way of showcasing this would be looking at a cause and effect matrix. And again, this is a very visual tool because you can directly see where you see a lot of it in red. You know that you have to focus on these particular unit operations, which is what OU stands for. So here we have the critical quality attributes, which you've defined previously, and you look at the unit operations. So the processes uh, that you're going through within your particular reactor, or within your plant. So it showcases you what critical process parameters there are as well, besides the critical quality attributes. So if there are changes within particular unit operation, how does that actually impact your critical quality attributes? And in some cases it doesn't, but here the key thing is to, to figure out which of them have the highest impact and that's clearly indicated within red. Now these are just some ways of how you can showcase uh, your design of experiments. So I wanted to show you the second case study because it's somewhat different. Uh, and, and here, unlike with uh, the previous case studies, uh, they couldn't really showcase lots of numbers, but they did clearly show that there was like a 30% uh, reduction in time of bringing something to market. Here there's more data available, but they didn't uh, have all the tools yet to critically define the design space. So it's much earlier on in the process. And that's the thing with QBD, you can apply this across different stages uh, within the development stage in the pharmaceutical industry. So here the tablets were coated with naproxen, which is a basic compound. So it will change the pH as you get dissolution of the tablet. So you can imagine, and you will see this later on, uh, that things around acid resistance are very different. So you're looking not necessarily at mixing of APIs, which you had in the previous one looking at tablets, but uh, a lot of other uh, things that come into play. And here they came up with four different steps, which you will see are fairly similar and to what they did in, in the previous uh, study. The first thing is the same because what you did, you would look at, you would undertake a risk assessment to look at the main variables. So again, your critical quality attributes that relate to quality. And they did a screening design uh, using some mathematical operations to specifically look at two parameters, which you will see within the, the next uh, slide on the fishbone diagram. 
And then they did the optimize the design to establish relationships. So these are mathematical equations between the critical quality attributes and other factors or parameters. And finally, what you would always tend to do is you have your model and you have the data from within the model. But how a model can actually capture unknown data, that's what assesses the robustness. And then you would usually need real data. So things that were done, for instance, uh, like on a small scale, so actually actual uh, experimental data to assess the accuracy. So the validation step is very important. And uh, as in the first example, you've seen that development time is important. This validation step can be equally as time consuming. Now, in my introduction to, to QBD, I've shown like an example of what a fishbone diagram looked like and showed that this is not a thing just within the pharmaceutical industry, uh, but uh, this also relates to, to within business. This is a method of how you can assess the risks uh, associated in this case with the, you know, the development of your product, but it does apply to other things as well. Now, in this case, it was applied to two specific parameters. Uh, in order to make it, because in the previous one you saw like they had around 15 CQAs, you can imagine that uh, usually you want to look at the principal components and really uh, reduce that in order to make it more manageable to assess. Now, because this drug has to change the pH, you can imagine that the acid resistance is, is quite an important one and also the cumulative release, because the drug will need to be released in order to change the pH. And it's split into different parts. So we're looking at the process itself. What do you apply? You look at, for instance, formulation, you look at the equipment that you have, but also you look at the people that you work with. So again, the people involved in the process, uh, maybe how they, for instance, how they need training, what kind of errors uh, you have within operating of the equipment and their skills, that all plays a very important role. So when you do this, you also look at, for instance, setting up standard operating procedures in order to make sure that every time the process is conducted in the same way. Likewise, when you, when you look at the equipment, you would also see what kind of sensors you would need. So here you would look at the pH meter, which you can imagine is fairly sensible considering the drug changes to pH. You could use UV-Vis, uh, which often can be used to, to monitor the concentration of certain drugs. A and there are other type of equipments that you can use in order to monitor these critical quality attributes. Now, with the first case study, I showed an example of the cause and effect matrix. So the between uh, a difference between the red and the green, uh, but also like having a diagram so you can visually look how X has an impact on certain Y values, so on, on the quality. There are other ways of how you can do this. Uh, and if you wanted to look at the design space, so that's the space in which you kind of want to operate to make sure that you reach the desired quality, you can also look at contour plots or surface plots. So this would also clearly show you in a very visual way what would happen uh, when uh, certain things go beyond your design space. So what do you need to monitor? And that comes back to this fishbone diagram because that will tell you exactly what you need to measure. So that feeds into this. So all of these are approaches to minimize your risk. Now, in, in this particular case study, they didn't, uh, it doesn't go quite as far along the development lines in the first one, uh, where they really had uh, data on the development uh, and uh, the validation time. So, so, but this one uh, did give information on how you would set up this design space. So you could put all of this together, and then when you start to undertake more experiments, you could put that together to define this design space and then see how that would work in practice. Now, hopefully what you've seen in here, what the advantages are of using this QBD approach and what you might actually use uh, if you were to work in a company specialized in, for instance, pharmaceuticals. The QBD really gives you a deeper understanding of the process uh, because it will tell you all the risks that are involved. And it also, because it has mathematical relationships, you could predict what would happen. So think, for instance, if you're working on a certain plant and you're getting a new supplier and, for instance, the the product that you work with, the raw products change. So what would be the risks associated with that? How do you need to make sure that you maintain the same quality? And you can do that because you know exactly what the impact is of changing certain parameters in your system. So we've seen how this can speed up the development of novel products. 
and it also minimizes the risks. And considering we are in the pharmaceutical industry where you have to go through multiple clinical trials, which uh, come with considerable costs and resources that you need, having the risks knowing up front and really saves in, in the long term. Now, first, the general step is we looked at the CQAs, which can be come from a combination of looking into literature, uh, but also experimental data. And then you would go to your uh, design of experiments in order to start to establish relationships between the CQAs and other variables. And also looking at, for instance, different processes that are involved along the way. Now, finally, what this would allow you to do is to de define the design space. So figuring out exactly what you would need to control. And then when you know what you need to control in order to have a good batch or good quality of what you want, you can start to implement monitoring strategies which comes with associated sensor equipment. Now, hopefully I've shown you a couple of diagrams that can be important and that you might use when you work with QBD, uh, but do have a look at the rest of this playlist, which goes into more details on other important concepts in the pharmaceutical industry.